Well, good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and happy Sabbath to you. Welcome to the online adult Sabbath school class for Northwest Houston SDA Church for January 6th, 2024. This is the first quarter, uh, uh, and this is the first Sabbath of that quarter. This quarter, we are studying how to read the Psalms. This study was compiled by the Adventist Mission, whose global mission centers help train people to share the good news of salvation with precious peoples from other world religions. So uh, let's begin our, our class, as we always do, with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are going to read this uh, and begin studying the Psalms this quarter. Those wonderful uh, words that were written by men, but inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I just pray that as we read them as men and women, uh, that we would understand what the Holy Spirit meant when it touched the hearts and minds of those people who wrote these wonderful, beautiful words. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin, as we always do, with our screen share. How to read the Psalms. This will be chapter one of our 13-week uh, study. You know, I, I was born in 1951, and I grew up in the 60s and 70s. And during the 60s and 70s, one of the most popular forms of uh, music uh, were ballads. And when I first began to study the Psalms, I began to think, uh, if I put these words uh, to music, what would they sound like? And uh, since there's a translational problem between uh, uh, Aramaic or, or Hebrew and uh, in English, uh, no matter what music I put them to today, they wouldn't sound quite like they did uh, uh, in the old days. But uh, the Psalms are written, many of them to be sung uh, as, as a form of praise and worship, as, as we'll get into as, as we study a little deeper. But how do we read the Psalms and how do we understand what was being written and how it was used uh, as a form of praise and worship? and adoration of God. So, so let's begin our lesson uh, with a memory verse. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the, the scriptures. Luke 24, 44 and 45. So Jesus here said, we can find him in the Psalms. Uh, they were written about him and for him, uh, you know, a thousand years before uh, his his birth. So uh, so let's read the Psalms uh, from that understanding that uh, Jesus said there about him. So the book of Psalms, or in Hebrew, uh, the word uh, means the book of praises, uh, is our study this quarter. The Psalms have been a prayer book and a hymn book for both Jews and Christians throughout the ages. And though the Psalms were predominantly uh, the psalmist's own words addressed to God, the Psalms did not originate with mortals, but with God, who inspired their thoughts. Just as the rest of the scripture is, uh, it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Indeed, the Lord inspired them to write what they did, which is why, as in all the scripture, uh, 1 Peter 1, 21 tells you, uh, all uh, scripture is inspired by God. Uh, God in the Psalms speaks to us through his servants and by his spirit. <laughs> Jesus, the apostles, and the writers of the New Testament cited the Psalms and referred to them as scripture. And we're going to read these uh, passages uh, in Mark, John, and John. Uh, they are as surely the word of God as the books of Genesis and the books of Roman. You know, I love studying history. As history is his story, the story of God, this great conflict between good and evil in this world. And uh, the story of Genesis is true history. <laughs> the story written by Paul in Romans is a true story. Uh, it, it, there's, it's history. It's not fable. It's, it's, uh, and that's why I love studying um, the Bible. Here are those three passages we're going to read about. Uh, Mark 12, 10. Haven't you read this passage from Scripture, Jesus said? The stones the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. He was quoting Psalm 118.22. Uh, 
Uh, in John 10, 34 and 35, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I have said that you are gods. If I, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, the scripture cannot be set aside. And that's a quote from Psalm 82, 6. And then again in John uh, chapter 13, verse eight, 18, I am not referring to all of you. I know uh, those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage in Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. And that was Psalm 41.9, speaking of Judas. So you see, uh, Jesus quoted the Psalms many times. The Psalms have been written in, in Hebrew poetry by different authors from ancient Israel. And so the Psalms reflect their particular world. However, uh, universal their messages. Accepting the Psalms as God's word and paying close attention to the Psalms' poetic features, as well as their historical, theological, and liturgical content, is fundamental in our understanding of their messages, uh, which reach across thousands of years uh, to our time today. So we need to we need to study, not just read uh, the Psalms. Now, what are the occasions that prompted the writing of some Psalms? Uh, we're going to read them uh, in, in the scripture. And when did God's people use the Psalms? Uh, in 1 Chronicles 16, 7, it says, On that day, David committed Asaph and his brothers to sing of thanksgiving to the Lord. So it was a day of celebration. Uh, Asaph, who wrote some of the uh, Psalms, uh, was to sing this song in thanksgiving to God. Uh, and Nahum, uh, in uh, Nahum 12, 8, the Levites were Yahshua, Benu, uh, Cadmiel, uh, Sherabeth, Judah, and also Mataniah, who together with his associates was in charge of the songs of thanksgiving. So uh, when the rededication, the new temple was uh, was being built uh, in the time of uh, Nahum, uh, these uh, were in charge of the Psalms of Thanksgiving, which which were uh, Psalms. <clears throat> Psalms 18, uh, 1. I love you, Lord, of my strength, of my strength. So the Psalms were written uh, to give praise to God uh, and show our love to him. Psalm 30 uh, and 1. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. So... They are songs of exaltation, to exalt God. Psalm 92, 1. It is good to praise the Lord and to make music to your name, O Most High. Music is a very important part of worship. And so uh, it is a way to give praise to God. And remember, the word psalm means praises. So the psalms are written to be praises to God. Uh, psalm 95, 2. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and songs. Um, and again, Psalm 105, 2, sing to him, sing praise to him, and tell of all his wonderful acts. So the Psalms are are all made to praise God and give glory to him uh, for what he has done, those marvelous things, uh, from creating us to saving us and giving us eternal life. In Colossians and Colossians 3 16 Paul goes on to tell the new church uh, after Jesus' death and resurrection that the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish them one another with all wisdom and through psalms and, the, and remember the word psalms means praises uh, hymns uh, and songs uh, from the spirit singing to God with gratitude in your heart so worship uh, from the very beginning of the church was through psalms and hymns and, and psalms, uh, lifting our voices to God. James 5.13 says, If anyone among you uh, in trouble, uh, let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise or psalms. So, uh, so we see the New Testament church, uh, James, the head of the church in Jerusalem, uh, and and Paul, uh, the apostle of the Gentiles, tells us the same thing. Singing psalms of praise, reading the, the psalms, uh, is part of our worship service. 
The psalms were composed for use in private and in communal worship. They were sung as hymns in temple worship, as suggested by the musical uh, annotations that mention instruments. Psalm 61.1 says, Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. Uh, tunes, Psalms 9.1. I, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart, and I will tell you uh, all your wonderful deeds. And music leaders, Psalms 8.1. Lord, our God, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. These were all occasions that prompted the writing of some psalms. And when did God people use psalms? And we'll get into that uh, as we go through this. But as we know, we've already read, uh, they were used in, in uh, worship, uh, both privately uh, and, uh, and in, in public. <clears throat> in Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew Bible, the title of the book of Psalms is Telemen, uh, which means praises. And it reflects the main purpose, that is, the praise of God. The English title uh, of Psalms was derived from the Greek word psalmio, uh, for, found in the Septuagint, an early 2nd or 3rd century B.C. Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The Psalms were an indispensable part of Israel's worship. For example, they were used in the temple dedication. Uh, we read about that uh, earlier. In religious festivals, uh, in processions, uh, I, I often think of uh, Jesus and his family walking uh, those 75 miles from uh, Nazareth to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, as they walked, they sang um, uh, hymns and songs. As the disciples and Jesus left from the Last Supper and went to the Garden of Gethsemane, they sang uh, hymns and, and psalms. So, so they were used in processions, as well as during the setting down of the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem that great festival uh, uh, that Sol Solomon oversaw. And you can read it in the, in the scripture. The Songs of Ascent, uh, Psalms uh, 120, 1 to 7, also known as the pilgrimage songs, were traditionally sung during the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, <laughs> as, as I mentioned, at the three major annual festivals. Remember, all the Jewish people, uh, all the males were commanded, and they brought their families too. Uh, to go to Jerusalem uh, three times a year. And uh, and uh, they sang uh, the songs of ascent. The Egyptian Hallel, uh, Psalm 113, uh, verses 1 to 9, and the great Hallel, Psalms 136, 1 to 26, were sung at the three major annual festivals. So you sing the song of ascent as you're going there, and once you get there, you would they would sing these other two, uh, uh, the Egyptian Hallel and, and the great Hallel. Um, including the festivals of the new moon and the dedications of the temple. The Egyptian Hallel received a significant place in the Passover ceremony. Because remember, <laughs> they were, Passover occurred in Egypt, right? Uh, Psalm 113, 1 to 9 uh, and 14 uh, were sung at the beginning of the Passover meal and Psalms 115, 1 to 18 at the end. Uh, it's, it's also in Matthew uh, 26, 30. The daily Hallel, Psalms 145, 1 to 21, was incorporated into daily prayers in the synagogue morning services. So, um, see, all these great uh, 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 Hallels or, or, or hymns were sung uh, as part of a, a worship, part of uh, giving God the glory for what he's done. Mm -hmm. The Psalms did not only accompany the people's worship, but they also instructed them on how they should worship God in the sanctuary. Jesus prayed with the words of Psalm uh, 22, 1 to 31 uh, in Matthew uh, 27, 46. The Psalms found a significant place in the life of the early church as well. Colossians 3, 16 reads, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through Psalms. First thing mentioned, hymns and songs of, up from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. And again, in Ephesians 5, 19, he, Paul wrote, speaking to one another with psalms, remember, psalms first, praises first, <laughs> uh, hymns and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. 
So for all of you uh, worship leaders out there, all of you just love to sing. <laughs> You're fulfilling scripture because it's the first and most important thing uh, for us to do is to, is to sing God's praises. Now, King David, whose name appears in the title of most Psalms, was active in organizing uh, the liturgy of Israel's worship. He is called the sweet psalmist of Israel, 2 Samuel 23 and 1. These are the last words of David, the inspired utterances of David, the son of Jesse, the utterance of the man exalted by the Most High God, the man anointed by God uh, of Jacob, the hero of Israel's songs. So uh, the New Testament uh, attests to the, the Davidic authorship of various psalms. Matthew uh, 22, 43 to 45, we read, he said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, this is this inspiration, uh, called him Lord? For he says, the Lord has said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? In reference to himself, uh, Jesus said. Uh, though we, of course, do not worship God in an earthly sanctuary like the temple, how can we use the Psalms in our own worship, whether in private or in a corporate setting, um, and to me that's that's no uh, that's no 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 difficulty. I love singing the psalms. I love singing hymns. I love playing them on my instruments. I love listening to them on the radio. I love praying them in church. Uh, singing sets me in the mood for worship of God and giving Him praise. So that's my answer. Uh, during your daily devotion today. You may talk with your family about what other reasons. Uh, how uh, how can we incor uh, incorporate this um, in, a, in our everyday setting and when we're not in church? King David, whose names appear in the thousands of most Psalms, was active in organizing liturgy. Okay. Um, he, he is called the sweet psalmist of Israel. The New Testament attests to David's... Uh, okay, we already read that. Sorry. Uh, uh, but it goes on Acts 2, 25, 29. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices and my body also will rest in hope because you have not will not abandon me uh, to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life uh, you have filled me with joy of your presence. Fellow Israelites, Paul says, uh, I can tell you with confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried in his tomb, uh, and his tomb is here today. Uh, for David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So uh, he's quoting here from the Psalm uh, uh, about Jesus from what David wrote. Acts 4.25 goes on to say, You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? So again, uh, uh, they're, they're quoting uh, the, the Psalms. Romans 4, 6 to 8. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin uh, the Lord will never count against him. So all these things that Jesus came to do were written earlier in the Psalms, uh, and David uh, wrote them as the Holy Spirit inspired. Numerous Psalms were composed uh, by temple musicians who were also Levites. For example, Psalm 50, verses 1 to 23, Psalms 73, uh, 1 to 28 and 83, were by Asaph, and we uh, remember, David appointed him as a head musician. Uh, Psalms 42, 1 to 11. Psalms 44, 1 to 26. Psalms 49, 1 to 20. Psalms 84, 1 to 12. Psalms 85, 1 to 13. Psalms 87, 1 uh, to 7 uh, were by the sons of Korah. Psalms 88, 1 to 18, also by Heman, the Ezraite. And Psalms 89, 1 to 52 by Ethan, the Ezraite. And that just means a descendant of Ezra. Uh, beyond them, Solomon uh, uh, 
and uh, uh, authored uh, these two Psalms, uh, 72, 1 to 20, Psalms 127, 1 to 5. And uh, Psalm, Psalm 1 is also accredited with writing 18 other Psalms that aren't in the scripture, but um, you can find them in, in uh, ancient pseudepigrapha. Uh, so, so Psalm 1 wrote other Psalms besides the two that, that made it in our scripture. And Moses uh, wrote Psalms 91 to 17. Uh, so those are just uh, the authors of, of some of the Psalms, along with David, who wrote the majority of them. Now, what do these Psalms reveal about the experiences of the authors we're going through? So uh, let's read Psalm 25, 1 to 5, and see what it says. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me put be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come to those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are my God, my Savior, and my hope uh, is in you all day long. So what was David saying here? Uh, he was having an experience of people, making, of people uh, uh, trying to shame him. Uh, and uh, and he put his trust in God. How about this one, Psalm 42, 1? As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. So um, uh, when we're thirsty, we, we turn uh, to a source of water. And uh, so our soul pants for, or is it in thirst uh, for God. Psalm 75, 1. We praise you, God. We worship you. For your name is near. People tell of your wondrous deeds. So that psalm is one giving praise to God. Uh, and again, looking to scripture, we can see all his wonderful deeds. Uh, the victory uh, uh, over sin and uh, the evil in this world. Psalm 70, 71, uh, 77, 1. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. So when he was uh, in need of help, uh, he cried to God and God answered Psalm 84, 1 to 2. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. Your My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. So uh, it, it was a song of desperation, uh, looking to God, uh, yearning to be here. My favorite, one of my favorite hymns, uh, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And I think of that every time I read this song. Psalm 88, 1, 3. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles, and my life draws near to death. So this psalm is one of desperation. A great tragedy occurs in your life. Uh, turn to God to hear your prayer. Psalm 89, 1. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make uh, your faithfulness known through all generations. And I, that's an evangelistic a psalm if I ever heard one. Uh, we need to open our mouths and, and uh, be faithful and tell people about God's faithfulness. So the Holy Spirit inspired the psalmist and used their talents in service to God and to their community of faith. The psalmists were people of genuine devotion and profound faith and yet prone to discouragements and temptations, as are the rest of us. Uh, they were no different than we are. People are no different. <laughs> we're no different than Adam and Eve. Uh, the only thing that changes is our technology and our times. But we had all the same emotions. Uh, it's all, all the same discouragements, all the same temptations. Uh, though written a long time ago, the Psalms actually reflect some of what we experience today. Remember, everything's the same, just technology changes. And, and situations, but uh, uh, personalities, uh, emotions, um, uh, inner interactions with other people, all the same. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear uh, to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles. And that means soul means uh, the body. Uh, that's the word. Uh, it means a breathing a breathing creature. <laughs> that's what soul means. For my my body. <laughs> is full of troubles, and my life draws near to the grave. Psalms 88, uh, 2 to 3. 
So uh, remember, Sister White says prayer is the most important uh, thing in our spiritual lives. So uh, this is the cry of the 21st century soul as much as it was some 3,000 years ago. This is Psalm 88, 2, 2 and 3. So sometimes mention hardships. Some focus on joys. The psalmist cries out to the Lord to save them and experience uh, his under, undeserved favor. They glorified God for his faithfulness and love, and they pledged their untiring devotion to him. The psalms or praises are thus testimonies of the divine redemption and the signs of God's grace and hope. The psalms or praises convey a divine promise to all who embrace uh, by faith God's gifts of forgiveness and of a new life. Yet at the same time, they do not try to cover up, hide, or downplay the hardships and suffering prevalent in this fallen world. I think of Job. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> you know, naked came I into the world, naked uh, shall I live. What we have in this world is, is all a gift of God. And uh, new gifts are ahead for us. Uh, a question for your devotion time today. How can we draw hope and comfort knowing that even faithful people, such as the psalmist, struggled with some of the same things that we do? That's what makes the psalms so special. You can read through the psalms and, and find every emotion listed there uh, that you're going through. And, and you can see the response uh, to it and to God. So um, think about that and talk about that today in your devotion time. Now, what different facets of human experience to these psalms convey. So remember, um, humanity is the same as it was at the time of Adam and Eve. Only circumstances have changed, uh, but we're the same. Psalms 3, 1 to 8. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many uh, are saying of me, God will not deliver him. You ever heard that? But you, Lord, are a shield around me. My glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down to sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, at my age, every morning when I open my eyes, I know it's God who has sustained me through the night. <laughs> so I will not fear, though ten thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies in the, on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessings be on your people. Remember, uh, vengeance is God's. Deliverance is God's. Um, it is his power. It's in him and it's not ours to defeat the enemy. Psalm 33, 1 to 3 says this. Sing joyfully to the Lord. Uh, you're righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with a harp. Make music to him on a ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. I know as I play my five-string banjo, <laughs> I wonder about somebody playing a ten-string lyre. <laughs> but uh, uh, I sing joyfully uh, and when I when I, I want to praise God and I, and I sing to him. Psalms 109, 6 to 15. Appoint someone evil to oppose my enemy. Let the accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him be found guilty. And may his prayers uh, condemn him. May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. I think of many stories in the Bible, and I'm sure you do too when you get into the book of Kings and, and, uh, and Chronicles, uh, about uh, God using another evil person to destroy the evil person that was attacking his people. So it's a uh, it's God who does it, and God who puts people in those situations. So we need to pray for that, uh, for God's appointment. Psalms 109, verses 9 to 15. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven from their ruined homes. And this is talking about the enemies of God's people. May a creditor seize all he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his labor. May no one extend kindness to him. 
excuse me, or take pity on his father and his children. May his descendants be cut off, their names blotted out from the next generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. May the sins of his mother never be blotted out. May their sins always remain before the Lord, that he may blot out uh, their name from the earth. And again, it's 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 a psalm that gives God the power. It takes the power out of our hands of vengeance. It's it's God's. The psalms make the believing community aware of a full range of human experience. And they demonstrate their beliefs uh, their believers can worship God in every season of life. In them, we see the following. <clears throat> there are six types of hymns here. Hymns that magnify God. For his majesty and power in creation, uh, his kingly rule, uh, judgment, and faithfulness. There are two hymns of thanksgiving. Uh, or psalms of thanksgiving. <clears throat> that express profound gratitude for God's abundance. There are laments, uh, and we read one of those, uh, that are heartfelt cries to God for deliverance from trouble. There are wisdom psalms that provide practical guidance for righteous living. There are royal psalms that point to Christ, who is the sovereign king and deliverer of God's people. And there are historical psalms. They recall Israel's past, and highlight God's faithfulness to Israel, to Israel's unfaithfulness, to teach the coming generations not to repeat the mistakes of their ancestors, but to trust God and remain faithful to his covenant. So hymns that magnify God, uh, they're thanksgiving hymns, uh, psalms, they're laments, wisdom psalms, royal psalms about Jesus, and hymns, uh, historical hymns. So those uh, uh, I consider the ballads. So, uh, so those are six different types of psalms that, that we'll be studying. The poetry of the psalms uh, demonstrates distinctive power to capture the attention of readers. Though some of these poetic devices are lost in translation, we can still, in our native language, appreciate many of them. So this is why studying the psalm uh, is as important as reading them, because there is a lot lost in translation. Any of you who are bilingual know that. You can never quite put uh, into a, uh, a words uh, something in your, your native language when you try to translate it, and especially uh, a rhyme and, and all the other things that, that go along with uh, with psalms and uh, and uh, ballads and singing. Parallelism is one of them. It involves combining a symmetrically constructed words, phrases, and thoughts. Uh, parallelism helps in understanding the meaning of corresponding parts. For instance, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, Psalms 103. In this parallelism, my soul is all that is within me, namely one's whole being. So uh, uh, those two words together mean your whole being. So uh, in translating in English, you don't see it like you would if you were looking at it in Hebrew. Imagery uses figures, figurative language to strongly appeal to the reader's physical senses. For example, uh, God's refuge is depicted as a shadow of his wings. So that's imagery. Uh, think of, think of a, a, um, a mother hen with her wings spread out over her chicks. Uh, Psalm 17.8. Uh, mirrorism uh, expresses uh, totally... Uh, by a pair of congesting parts, uh, totality, by a pair of congesting parts. I have cried day and night before thee, uh, denotes crying without ceasing. Uh, so that's that's the totality, day and night. Uh, that's Psalms 88.1. Word plays, that's a very important part. Uh, and that's what I like to study. Uh, you can go in and find a concordance sometimes or, or a good book on Psalms and, and check these words out and, and see uh, how they're employed, how they would be seen by, by a, a, a Hebrew reader. Uh, they employ the sound of words to make a pun and a highlight a spiritual passage, such as Psalms 96, 4 and 5. The Hebrew Elohim means gods, and Elohim 
means idols. Two opposite things, God and the idols, right? Uh, they create a wordplay to convey a message that the gods of the nations only appear to be Elohim, uh, gods, but they are merely Elohim, idols. So uh, they uh, may appear to be God, but they're just idols. Um, For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, Elohim. Uh, for all the gods of the nations are idols, Elohim. But the Lord made uh, the heavens. So that's where those uh, those two words uh, are used. And finally, uh, we'll, the word Selah. Uh, many times you've probably seen the word Selah as you read uh, some translation of the Bible. The uh, NIV doesn't like using it, so they've excluded it. Uh, but uh, but many of the translations use the word Selah because it appears uh, in, in the uh, Hebrew. Uh, it denotes a brief interlude, uh, either for a call to pause and reflect on the message of a particular section uh, of the Psalms or a change in a musical accompaniment, uh, a, a key change, as we would say. Psalm 61, 4 reads, I long to dwell in your tents forever and to take refuge in the shelter of your wings, Selah. So you're to read that passage and think about it. Uh, so. Second Samuel 23, one to two. And these are the last words of David, the inspired utterance of David, the son of Jesse, the utterance of a man exalted by the Most High, a man anointed by the God of Jacob, a hero of Israel, Israel's songs. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. And uh, Romans 8, 27, 6 and 27. In this way, the Spirit has helped us in our weakness. We do not know that we ought to pray, what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us uh, with wordless groans. He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So when we pray, when we speak, we need to stop and wait to hear what the Spirit has to say. The Psalms were inspired prayers and praises of Israel. And so in Psalms, uh, the voice is that of God intermingled with that of his people. The Psalms assume the dynamic of vivid interaction with God. It's not one-sided, the Psalms. The Psalmist addresses God personally as, My God, O oh Lord, my King. Uh, Psalms 5, uh, 2, and Psalms 48, 3 are examples of that. The Psalmist often implores God to give an ear. Uh, Psalms 5, 1. Hear my prayer. Psalms 39, 12. Look. Psalms 25, 18, answer me, Psalm 102, 2, and most importantly, deliver me, Psalms 6, 4. These are clearly the expressions of someone praying to God, uh, not just blank words on a page. So um, it's an interaction that we read in the Psalms. That's why so many people like to use them for their time of meditation and their prayer time and devotion time. The remarkable beauty that appears in the Psalms as prayers and praises, lies in the fact that the Psalms are the words of God in the form of the pious prayers and praises of believers. The Psalms thus provide God's children with moments of intimacy, such as described in Romans 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray or what we ought but the Spirit itself makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit takes our prayers, translates them to God, and, gives, and intercedes on our behalf. Jesus too quoted from uh, the Psalms, such as uh, these passages in Luke 20, uh, 2, 43, where he quoted directly from Psalms 110, 1. Now David said to, uh, now David himself said in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand 
till I make your enemies your footstool. So, <clears throat> although the Psalms have uh, sprung from or, or uh, refer to specific historical events and experience of the psalmists themselves, as well as the experiences of Israel as a nation, the psalm's spiritual death speaks to a variety of life situations and crosses all cultural, religious, ethnic, and gender boundaries. In other words, as you read the Psalms, you will find them expressing hope, praise, fear, anger, sadness, and sorrow. Things that people everywhere in every age, no matter their circumstances, face. They speak to all of us in a language or our own experience. So, as we said earlier, mankind hasn't changed. <laughs> Since Adam and Eve, uh, we have that weakness uh, that was because we have choice. God gave us free will and choice for a reason, uh, so that we would follow him out of our own ambitions, our own love, our own expressions, not being forced like a robot or a pre-programmed uh, 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 computer program. Uh, and it's that, it's that that is our weakness. We have the choice. We can say yes, we can say no. We can accept God, we can reject God. So, um, but we all uh, come to that point where we have all of these emotions that, that we just read about. Uh, and uh, and the Psalms express those same emotions uh, from thousands of years ago. And we can read them and apply them to our lives. So a question for your prayer time today, your devotion time. What should Jesus' use of the Psalms tell us about the importance that they could play in our own faith experience? If they were good enough for Jesus, are they good enough for you? Something to think about. Talk about during your devotion time today. Now, what place does God occupy in the psalmist's life? Psalm 16.8 says this, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. So kind of central part there. That's Psalm 44, 8. In God, we make our boasts all day long, for we will praise your name forever. So do we boast in ourselves? No. In God, we make our boast. God is, God is everything. Uh, remember, Paul's name, uh, when you get into the New Testament, Paul's name means I am nothing. I am small or nothing. And uh, once he became a Christian, he realized God is everything. So we, he made his boast uh, in the Lord from his time of his conversion to the time of his death. So we need to do the same thing. Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. So uh, what place does God occupy? Uh, he's, that, he's that mother hen's wing that covers us. He's that uh, rock. <laughs> that we shelter under. Uh, he is everything to us. Psalm 47, 1 and 7. Clap your hands, all you nations, and shout to the Lord with cries of joy. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him in psalms of praise. <laughs> this praise is praise. I like that. So uh, uh, we should we should rejoice in God. <laughs> shout to, with cries of joy, for he's given us everything. And we'll continue to do that. Psalm 57, 2. I cry out to the God most high, to God who vindicates me. You know, our vindication doesn't come on our, of our own. Uh, God vindicated us. We are but sinners uh, and uh, not worthy of anything, but God, God vindicates us. Psalm 62, 8. <clears throat> Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Again, Pour out your hearts to him. Trust in him. Um, that's his, uh, his place should be a, a center, central to us. Psalms 82, 8. Rise up, O God. Judge the earth. For all the nations are your inheritance. You know, God is king not just of the church. He is the king of all creation. <clears throat> Psalm 121, 7. The Lord will help you from, keep you from all harm. He watches over your life. Uh, he will give you eternal life, uh, no matter what happens to you in this life. Um, the Lord will keep you from all harm uh, eternally. 
The world of the Psalms is wholly God-centered. Uh, it seeks to submit in prayer and praise all life experiences to God. God is the sovereign creator, the king and judge of all the earth. He provides all things to, for his children. Every, I'm 70, uh, almost 73 years old now. And every day of my life for 73 years, everything I have had, God has provided for me. And he's given me everything I need. <laughs> I, I can tell you that. Uh, therefore, he is to be trusted at all times. Uh, even the enemies of God's people ask, where is your God? Uh, when God's people seem to be failing, Psalms 42, 10. And we'll see, you see that as you read many of these uh, conquering uh, kings. Uh, where's your God? He's allowed this to happen to you. And just about the time they get through saying that, <laughs> God frees his people and, uh, and they get put to shame. Just as the Lord is an ever-present and never-failing God of his people, so God's people have God always before them. Remember, that's what the, we read earlier. Uh, God should be always before us, frontmost in our minds. Ultimately, the Psalms envision a time when all peoples of the entire creation will worship God. And I, I, I can't wait till that day when Jesus comes and takes us home and brings us back to a new world in which every nation, every people will, will all have the same uh, love and compassion of God and, and live together in harmony and unity, and we not be divided tribe against tribe uh, as they are now. Psalm 47, 1, clap your hands, all you nations, and shout to God with cries of joy. Uh, Psalm 64, 9, all people will fear. They will proclaim the works of God and ponder what he has done. Uh, that time will come when uh, the evil is put away and everybody acknowledges God. The centrality of God and uh, the procedure of central, uh, the central, precedes the centrality of worship. The worship uh, in which the Psalms, Psalms lived was fundamentally different from the worship as understood by many people today. Remember, they had uh, sacrifice uh, and everything else as a part of their worship, which is different than what we do today. Uh, different from worship, okay, because worship in the biblical culture was the natural and undisputed center of the entire community's life. Therefore, everything that happened, both good and bad, in the life of God's people inevitably was expressed in worship. God hears the psalmist wherever he may be and responds to him in his perfect time. So in Psalm 34, I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. Psalm 18, 6. In my distress, I call out to the Lord. I cry to the God for help. From his temple, he heareth my voice, and my cry came before him into his ears. Psalms 26. Now this I know. Uh, now this I know. <laughs> the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He calls him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. So, uh, and who's on God's right hand? It's Jesus. <clears throat> the psalmist is, is introducing a place uh, in heaven, but at the same time, God dwells in Zion, in the sanctuary among his people. God is at the, the temple, uh, is at the same time, far off and near and everywhere, uh, and in his temple. Uh, Psalms 11, 4, you know, he's omnipresent. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eye examines him. Again, omnipresent. Uh, God is hidden. Psalms 10, 1. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in a time of trouble? And he is disclosed. Psalms 14, uh, 41, 12. Because of my integrity... You uphold me and set me in your presence forever. In the Psalms, these apparently mutually exclusive characteristics of God are brought together. The psalmist understands that the proximity and remoteness were inseparable within a true being of God. You know, God is both in heaven and here on earth. 
Uh, so he's both remote and and he's close. And um, those are facts. Uh, and uh, the psalmist uh, uh, give us facts. Remember, our scripture is true. Uh, it's not uh, it's not some fable or some myth. Uh, Psalms 40, uh, 24, 7 to 10 says, Lift up your head, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. The psalmist understood the dynamics of this spiritual tension. Their awareness of God's goodness and presence amid whatever they were experiencing is what strengthened their hope while they uh, wait for God to intervene, however uh, and whenever uh, he chooses to do so. Now, remember, of all the peoples in the world, and you can read the history of many nations, uh, I like studying history, uh, the people of Israel, God's people, uh, and us Christians today uh, are the most uh, persecuted people in the entire world. And we always have been. Uh, anyone who follows God, remember Jesus said himself, uh, the world hates me, and because the world hates me, the world will hate you. And and though uh, we think of the Holocaust and other things, um, though uh, God's people were exiled, God's people were murdered, God's people are, are driven out of communities. Um, look at Christians in China and places today. Uh, God is always there, even though we don't always see him. He is yet, he is far away and yet he is near. Now, here are two, two questions to answer today in your, your devotion. How can the Psalms help us understand that we cannot limit God to certain aspects of our existence only? We can't say, God, because I'm not being blessed today in some very special way that I want to be blessed in, you're not listening to me. Um, is he listening? Yes, he always listens. Uh, but discuss that today. And what might be parts of your life in which you are seeking to keep the Lord at a distance? Do you have something that you might be hiding, trying to hide from God? <laughs> I think of Adam and Eve whenever I think of that. <laughs> they thought they were hiding from God. <laughs> But there's no hiding from God. So, brothers and sisters, we need to bring our sins to Jesus uh, and let him take them away, not try to keep him at a distance uh, and do our own thing. So, uh, anyway, two good questions to talk to, about today in your devotion time. Now, what does it mean uh, that the Psalms were divine human prayers and hymns? Uh, what does that mean? How could they be both divine and human? Uh, these prayers and hymns. And we discussed that a little earlier, but uh, you might talk about that today. And how does this idea, however difficult to fully grasp, help us to see the closeness that God wants with his people? Um, remember, he said of Moses, he spoke to him face to face like a friend. <laughs> Isn't that how you want God? He said of David, remember, uh, David, uh, sinful as he was, was a man after my own heart. So uh, we can't fully grasp how God can do this, but uh, we need to talk about it. We need to think about it. We need to pray about it. Now, how does it reveal uh, in its own way how close to humanity and to each of us God is? I, I remember that famous word, Emmanuel, God is with us. I remember Jesus saying, there'll come a time when we don't worship in the temple because the God will be within our hearts uh, as he was preparing his people for the Holy Spirit. So uh, anyway, th these are three good discussion questions uh, for today. Uh, and we're, you're not in class, but you might want to talk about this with your, your family during devotion. Talk about a time in which you found something in the Psalms speaking directly to your own situation. And what comfort and hope did you find there? So talk about that um, among your family. Uh, if you've uh, read uh, psalms together, uh, or bring out your Bible and read a psalm together. We talk about a time when you found something in the psalm speaking directly to your own situation. And what comfort or hope did you find? So that's our that's our lesson uh, for today. 
<clears throat> I hope you did your lesson this week. Uh, if not, I hope this recap of the lesson helped you uh, in understanding the Psalms. We're going to go deeper into the Psalms. Remember, we need to understand uh, a lot of things about how uh, uh, they were written uh, and not just take them at face value. Because a lot of times, taking something at face value uh, can be confusing. Uh, uh, let me just give one quick example. When Jesus was talking to his disciples about a rich man uh, going to heaven, he said it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. And his, uh, his disciples were fishermen. And uh, in those days, uh, the huge rope that was used to moor boats to the shore was made out of camel's hair. And uh, the fishermen call it a camel. So uh, his disciples, who were fishermen, the, their minds immediately went to the thought of, how do you take a huge cable, a huge rope, and put it through the eye of a needle? You can't do that. <laughs> so if we get an understanding of, of the meaning of words uh, from the Old Testament uh, and from the New Testament, because there are New Testament cases just like this, uh, we can understand uh, how the scripture more fully. It's not some ridiculous statement of trying to shove a camel through the eye of a needle. <laughs> he was talking about a rope and a needle. So uh, the Bible, uh, you can understand the Bible a lot better if you use a concordance, um, if you uh, study uh, some, some reference books. And we'll be doing that this quarter on the Psalms. We'll understand the Psalms more deeply, like uh, the green pastures talked about in the Bible. What does that mean and why was that so important? But we'll get to those things later. I want to thank you for being here today. I hope you have a wonderful Sabbath day. Uh, Sabbath is always such a good day of rest and relaxation, being close to God. Uh, as Adam and Eve were every afternoon when God came to walk with them. And we get one day a week that we can spend the day with God. So spend that day with God and your family uh, in worship and uh, in, uh, in adoration of God, uh, putting the world aside uh, and uh, let's have a word of collegiate prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all these wonderful uh, believers, uh, those who are listening to your word, those uh, absorbing uh, what the Holy Spirit had to say. I thank you for all of them. I ask a blessing upon their houses, a uh, blessing upon my, our house today, a blessing upon our church as we worship together. And uh, may uh, you uh, see us through another week as we study a lesson two about Psalms. And bring us next week uh, together again uh, to, to uh, study your word in depth um, and uh, bring to mind uh, those things that we have learned. Uh, for the time is growing short, Lord, and we will have to share our knowledge with others and draw them to you before it's too late. So bless us and be with us uh, for another week is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you again for attending, and uh, I hope to see you next week.